Professionals understand this goal and thus direct their energies, self-study and unit development in particular, toward achieving it. So all Marines are trying to become professionals. Professionals. True experts in the conduct of war. As professionals, we recognize that development of coercive tools must be balanced with the need to attract in competition as well. For example, one component of an attraction strategy could lead to greater deterrence through building increased interoperability with an ally. It could also lead to advances through the informal element of national power as we perform disaster relief mission. Marines must remain alert for the opportunities to use and integrate both coercion and attraction into the larger competition. So the Marine Corps is not, they're, they're saying here, we're, we're not just here to fight wars. We're here to build relationships. Now at Echelon Front, we talk about building relationships all the time. That's, what, that's how you lead. You lead by building relationships. That's how you get things done, by building relationships. And what we're talking about here is we are competing. And in order to compete, guess what we do? We build relationships. We build relationships. And just to give people an example, and I'm sure you have some more, Dave, but especially before the war started for me in the 90s, this is what the SEAL teams did. Go to a country, train their special operations unit, do a big exercise, train them in the use of our weapons. We train in the use of their weapons. We send some people to learn how to speak their language. We bring some people to learn that they can learn how to speak English. We form these relationships. We work together. So that way, we're strengthening our allies. We have somebody we can rely upon. We get to know them better. That's just relationships. That's what it is. Did you guys do that in the, in the pilot world? Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking about carrier deployments. And I think right now there's a connotation that the aircraft carrier, and it's probably already ex- always existed, but certainly now since you know, post 9-11, the carrier is this power projection tool, this, you know, the, um, uh, you know, 90,000 tons of diplomacy, you know, sovereign U.S. soil, all of the, you know, they have these great taglines that the Navy leverages, which which are true in a lot of ways, but pre-9-11, if you ever did a cruise pre-9-11 like I did back in the day, the joke, that those, the, we called them pleasure cruises. It was like 13, 14 port calls. And the two months, you know, that you you sailed from San Diego to, to the Persian Gulf was a bunch of port calls. You're, you're, Doing joint operations with different countries, you're 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 pulling up peer side and contributing to their economy. You're building all those relationships, and most of it is allies or or people we want to build relationships with. Then you go to the Gulf for a couple months, do that thing, and in that you're doing three or four port, call, uh, port calls to Bahrain, to the UAE, all these places that we're trying to strengthen relationships. And that that the carrier was an instrument of power projection; it was an instrument of diplomacy, which was building those relationships. Obviously, post nine eleven, you know, my experience, my second cruise was like go to the North Arabian Gulf, stay there for seven months, come home. <laughs> but you know, de- b- before that, the investment the Navy was making was mostly strengthening the relationships. And there are stories out there, even somewhat recently, that carriers would deploy for disaster relief with no aircraft on them, just to send a carrier to help, you know, floods and and crazy things that happen in different places strictly for strengthening ties and relationships that are projecting literal no combat power by design because the Navy see, well, I'm sure it's larger than just the Navy, but that's my connection. And, you know, I deployed off carriers for the most mm. part. No, that, so that's attraction, right? That's, that, that's attraction as opposed to deterrence, right? Yeah. We're just trying to show people that, hey, we're, you want to be friends with us. Yeah. You wanna be, we're attractive. We can help you if you get no time and need. We're a good ally. At a tactical level, when I would deploy in the 90s, back in the day, we would go out and do exercises where I would be in the jungle with some special operations unit from some other country. What do you do when you are a fighter pilot? Same thing. Are you're, you giving you're... them a tour? Are you taking them in the backseat? Like at a tactical level, just out of my own curiosity, what would you do? You're you're flying with them. You're spending time with them, and and there's a wait, little wait, bit. Wait, wait, wait. Are they flying their aircraft? Yep. And so they're your wingman, and you work some yeah, stuff. Yeah, you're and integrating with them. Sometimes you fight against them. Sometimes you fight with them. Really, what it's supposed to be is kind Did of. Did you this, ever put your ego in check and let one of these, what let one of these foreigners beat beat you in a dogfight? <laughs> no, dude. Come <laughs> on, man. Zero percent chance. Zero. Now, certain countries they would have. We would fly with different countries that they would have different ROE, different rules 
uh, training rules and things like that. And you could see some of them were geared very specifically to make sure that certain people had advantages. And we would play by those rules and, and sometimes get in trouble for not following those rules. Mm. Uh, you know, one of the things that's really cool about the American military, and certainly in aviation, and there's a saying we have, there's like, hey, there's no rank in the cockpit. So I could be the junior dude in the squadron. I'm not saying this happened very often, but you could be a mid-level guy. You're gonna go out and fly with your boss. And once you start fighting him, like you can pummel him to just pummel him into the ground. And it's it's there is no like deference, like I don't want to make the old man look bad. You you go out there and do your thing. Um that's not always like that. But the the interaction in some sense was this idea that this American military with this big might, this big power, our aviation world is is something they can learn from. But we always learn stuff from them too. We would share briefing techniques and how they ran their briefs, how they trained their guys, how they did certain things. And a lot of it, at least on paper, was for us to bring to them things that could help them get better. But it was always reciprocal. We always learned from operating with other countries. And I flew with pilots and airplanes from all sorts of different countries, even sometimes the same exact airplane, but they fly it differently. They do things differently. So there's a whole bunch of things that you can do to interact with them that is beneficial for both. It was probably lopsided. Our, what we knew and how we did it was usually more, more beneficial to them, but it wasn't completely one-sided either. Flying dissimilar with different countries is a blast because you learn stuff and go, oh man, we don't do that in our airplanes. That's really good for me to see. It makes me more prepared for if something actually really happens. Would you guys go toe to toe, Top Gun dogfight style, one on one? Yeah, you'd have a, you'd have different things. It, it, I've never been in a situation where if the brief was you and me are going to fight, I don't care what country or what plane. Once fights on, it is game on. There is no like, hey, go easy on this guy or let this guy. I have never been in a dogfight once in my life. Other than, hey, I'm there to show you certain things. Mm -hmm. But if it's like a real dogfight, like just a real fight, you're just, you fly your best airplane. There are times that you would dial back your best jet because it'd be (laughs) really, it would undermine the effectiveness of the training. Of the relationship building as well. (laughs) But it never to like, oh, you did, we're never to. Oh, good job. You really caught me off guard there. Yeah, yeah. You got me. That, that would be happening. that would be you know in in the heyday of when you're a, a top gun IP and you're fighting against a, a, you know somebody else and you're going to come back no joke you come back with 25 30 valid shots that can be really disheartening for somebody mm-hmm. to look on paper and go hey let me see your shot card and they've got zero shots and you're like oh hang on I need to get my second sheet of paper and if there's a top gun IP or a weapon school IP listening to this they're laughing right now because you can come back with in four or five sets five, six shots per, and you have 30 valid shots, and the other guy's got zero. If you do that set after set after set after set after a while, it'd be like you and me rolling on the mats, mm-hmm. and you doing nothing but trying to beat me. You're not teaching me, you're not training me, you're just <laughs> mm-hmm. gonna beat me. You're like, bro, what? I don't wanna do this anymore. So you would <laughs> dial that back, but you'd never be like, oh, Dave, that was amazing how you did that. I, I, I didn't think you could, you would never get to that level of, of that in, a, in an actual fight. When we're training and doing other things, yeah, you, you, you're there to learn, and they, they learn from you, learn from them. But I've never been in a one 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 v one where I'm dialing it back because somebody needs, you know, somebody's saying, "Hey, don't don't fight your best jet." Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm only doing that, you know, in a tactical sense of helping him see sight pictures and maneuvering in a way that's benefiting him, uh, but not like because I feel bad or or something like that. Are the personalities of the foreign countries? fighter pilots similar to Americans. Yeah, th- one other thing too, and I, I'd be interested in, in what you saw with special forces around the world. What I came to find is despite what appears to be a whole bunch of differences between different countries, when it came down to it, the personalities of fighter pilots are really similar. There are differences. There are some cultural things, there are some organizational things, but at the end of the day, fighter pilots that fly fighters in any country, in every type, any type of fighter, they're much more similar than they are different. Yeah, same thing with special operations. They'd have there's definitely some some differences in culture and whatnot, but it's it's a pretty thin pretty thin layer that you have to pull back, and all of a sudden, oh, these guys are yeah. kind of just like us. The it's mentality, no, no yeah, deal. totally. Yeah, uh, from a maintenance perspective, f- w- it seems like just the American sort of from manufacturing to like maintenance, the maintenance programs in the Navy, you know, even in the SEAL teams, we would, especially before the, once the war started, we kind of, we we saw less of the Navy kind of administrative stuff right. on our, in inside the terms. But 
when the nineties, it was like, Hey, you got to do these protocols that the big Navy follows. And, and so you'd see, Oh, well, you know, these guys are squared away. Like the Navy is squared away. There's a reason that when you, when you pull a piece of firefighting gear off of a sh- wall on a ship that's been there for three years, it works. It works because it's gone through this maintenance check. Yeah. It's gone through every 30 days and every 90 days it's gotten this and it's gotten this and the other thing. Is, are there, are, do foreign countries have that same level of uh, being squared away from a maintenance perspective? You know, I don't know. I, I don't know if I ever got to that level, that layer of fidelity. I will say that the American military, certainly the Navy and the Marine Corps, where I get most of my experience with, that is something we take really, really seriously. And what you just described is the equipment that we have, the things we have as old as they are, whatever, the things that we have work. And that when I manned up an aircraft, I never once got on an airplane and felt like kind of sketchy about it. Never once did I get in an airplane and not feel like I'm getting into the plane, and I'm not sure. I'm not sure if that's true for for other countries or, or other other services. Well, outside of America, but I always and I've flown with the Navy a lot. I've flown with the Marine Corps a lot. I've flown with the Air Force a lot, and that is universal. Okay, so I have a different feeling, and I have gotten into aircraft and been completely sketched out with both my fingers crossed, hoping that this thing is going to make it. And in all those cases, it was in a it was in an aircraft that was not an American military aircraft. And you're going, well, I guess this is we could go down like that. This could be it. I never had the best feeling. And what's weird is, you know, the the other thing about the American military aircraft is they're working, man. Like the Navy helicopters, they're great. They're just they're yeah. it's the you know what they are? They're daily drivers. Yeah, they're a daily driver. A, a CH-46, a Navy CH-46, that thing is a daily driver. That yeah. thing is a Ford F-150 that's just ready. It's, yeah. you, that thing is gonna do its job. Yeah. So I always felt, con- even though there'd be hydraulic fluid all over the deck and it would, ju- it would be a little bit, it would look sketchy, but you're, you know that that thing's been flying, well first, of, how old is the CH-46 platform? 19, early 1960s? Yeah. And some of those birds are from the 1960s, yep. still flying. Well, at least they were still flying when, when I was in. Yeah. All right, little tangent right there. And what's interesting is everything we just talked about all plays, that, that's what this whole book is about. It's about competition, but it's all those things, that's the reason I was kind of diving into it. It's all these things are how we are competing with our allies and with our rivals and we're letting everybody know that this is what we've got and these are capabilities and this is what we can do like that's all part of the game yeah and i was thinking that 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 tangent was also like that's what makes us professionals that's the profession of what we're doing it's not a it's not a it's not a hobby as fun as it is it's it's flying airplanes all those are professional things and that's when we were uh, working with other countries the one thing i will say this is that i know when, when you were gonna fight someone outside of your squadron, so another squadron, and then outside of the service, like we're gonna go with the Air Force, you you had the sense of like, hey, you gotta, you gotta be on your A game. When we were fighting with other countries, it was like you you were gonna show them your absolute best game in everything we do, from brief to shut down and everything in between. So there was a sense of looking the part and that ev- every step away from your squadron, from your bros, that went up higher. Like, don't you go fight with the Air Force and embarrass us. Mm-hmm. And when you're fine with, you know, working with foreign countries, the need to look professional was absolutely understood. Verbalized at all or no? Uh, un- absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Check. Who would you train with? Like, for example, like what, what other country? Let me, I mean, okay. So I have trained personally with Canadians, Australians, Brits, Saudis, uh, Emiratis, Kuwaitis, Singapore, Malaysia, I'm, and I'm, I'm running out. There's more. Yeah, and these are all just air forces or services, your countries that fly different airplanes or interacted in some way. Yeah. Um, Japan, a, a whole bunch of countries. The, do you ever fly their planes? So every, <laughs> you said something, I'm kind of laughing at it, and I didn't know we we're going to circle back to it. Every single time you go do this, kind of the last day or two, you have some graduation thing, and they're always offering, hey, you jump on our, and I remember, I flew single-seat airplanes, so it wasn't always that we could do that, but if there's a two-seat <laughs> jet or something, we always offering, and they're always offering us, hey, jump in the back seat. I never once, never once, 
I don't want to be in the back seat. First of all, of anything, certainly not of a <laughs> you know a former Soviet Union MiG twenty nine. That's you know, wow. Yeah. I never got in the back seat of somebody else's airplane. You were busy. Couldn't do it that day. Not available. <laughs> um, and that I think is what you were saying. Like I, I don't know anything about any of these. I don't know this, about this airplane. And yeah. first of all, I don't want to be in the back seat. I don't know if the cool and guys would guys would kill for that stuff. And I never wanted to do it. Mm-hmm. Being a back of a of a flanker or a MIG or something, go for it, dude. That's all you. Yeah. Well, sometimes you'd have the same planes though, right? Or no? Yeah, Canadians, Australians, we flew the exact same airplanes. Yeah. It's the like in the SEAL teams, if you're going to do something, you're in some foreign aircraft. The only way to get out of it would be to basically quit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you you can't say like, "Well, hey guys, I'm not really comfortable with this aircraft." Yeah. And so you're sitting there in a squad. God. And every single one of those, probably like, there's every single one of those guys is thinking we should not be doing this. <laughs> and every single one of those guys doesn't say a word about it, gets on that bird, and goes and does what you got to do. Not me. 